let's start the show. It's time for This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Do we have a visual treat for you today? I'm your host, Kishore, in for Norm this week, who is in New Zealand. And we made some changes while he was gone. Mm -hmm. Thanks to Danica. Mrs. Chan. Yeah, well, I call her Danica still. Mm -hmm. uh, Came in, painted the podcast room, cleaned it up, evicted our mice friends that were living here. Did you know about them? I had no idea. Yeah, I didn't either. That grosses me out. Uh, and now we have something pretty. We have something pretty. I can't wait to sully it with mm-hmm. this this hour and a half long podcast. <laughs> Welcome in. I'm joined, as always, by co-host Jeremy Williams. Greetings. Salutations. And first time guest, one of my faves, Shannon Morse. Hi. Welcome in. Shannon is the, the co-host of Tech Thing mm-hmm. and Threat Wire yep. and does a number of projects with Hack5 mm-hmm. and has the Snubs Report. Her That's own right. Personal YouTube channel I too. Do. Thanks for coming in. And Shannon, you're here this week partially because A, we love you. And B, uh, you were at CES for the meltdown that was CES <laughs> twenty eighteen. Yeah, it was a it was a shit show. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get into the shit show. But first, because this is your first time on the show, we're gonna get into a little bit more about Shannon. So we have five questions for Shannon. Oh, Are wow. you ready yeah. to play? I'm scared. Okay, here we go. You've gone to a lot of different destinations over the over the past year. Hawaii, Tokyo. I, I think you went to the Pacific Northwest. What was your favorite travel destination of all the places you went in of, the past year? Ooh, of all the places I went, um, it would have to be it would have to be Tokyo, Japan, for sure. Any I did particular... go to Australia as well. That was one of my places that I went. Was it your first time? Yes, it was. Wow. Uh, I went to, I've been to Japan twice now. Once was in May of 2015, 2016, one of those. And then the other one was November of this past year. So I went with my, for my birthday. I spent my birthday in Tokyo, Japan, sang karaoke until three o'clock in the morning. It was the best thing ever. I, I got to sing Japanese anime at a karaoke bar in a skyscraper. And it was like a dream come true. Sounds like lost in translation. It basically was. Yeah, it was it was incredible. <laughs> Not bad. Uh, if you had any caffeine source you could have on a desert island, what would it be? And be specific. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, Lipton black tea with two cups of sugar in a gigantic, like, two-gallon container. Wait, the two cups of sugar is going to last you, or you need that, like, for every cup? I would need that for, like, every cup. Wow. Yeah. Lipton. It's, it's Southern style, okay? No, Lipton's so, for real. Style. Lipton, <laughs> Lipton sweet black tea Heck yeah. is the best thing ever. And I love it so much. I I drink it like every single day. There's a kick-ass barbecue place here in the city called Cathead's Barbecue. Ooh. Uh, in, it's kind of near Soma, I suppose. Highly recommend their sweet tea because I actually inquired. Ooh. I said, how do you make this so delicious? And he said, it's just Lipton tea. Yeah. And sugar. Yeah. That's how we do it. My family's from the South. So Lipton style Southern sweet tea is yeah. like the thing. And you'd brew it with the sun? No, actually we do it. <laughs> we do it straight on the stove. It's really easy. All right. The secrets of sweet tea are coming out now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sugar and boiling water <laughs> and Lipton, apparently. Basically. Tech product you can't live without? Mm, tech product I can't live without. I, I know that cell phone would be like the easy thing to say. I'm going to say my Nintendo Switch. Really? Wow. Yeah. We are we are just passing through all sorts of people that mm-hmm. love the Switch. Yep. Really? Yeah. Wow. It's the, fast, it's the fastest selling uh, home console ever in Japan, I think. Yeah, I'm I'm not surprised, honestly, because it's it's the first time that I've had a video gaming console where I was just like, 
oh, you know what? I can take this on a plane with me and I can still play Zelda and it still looks amazing. And the sound quality is beautiful with a pair of headphones and just yeah. like I'm in awe with how well the the Nintendo Switch plays really good quality games. And the battery lasts a long time, especially if you have like a good powered, even like a little cell phone battery, mm-hmm. just a, a big bank. You're good to go for like a, a cross Atlantic trip or something like that. Norm and I flew to uh, CERN last year, and basically, Norm and I didn't talk for the entire flight uh, because he pulled out his switch, and then we just stopped talking. <laughs> and then, like, and then all of a sudden, it's we true. were in, we we're in France. You needed one. It's totally true. I was good. I, I like I I did normal things on a plane. Like I watched movies. I slept. Whatever. Oh yeah, I not me. I can't normal. sleep on a plane, so I like to entertain myself somehow, and the Nintendo Switch gives me that ability. Uh, not to mention that, like, you, you can bring the little Pro controller, and it's so much more comfortable than just the little Joy Cons, which terribly suck, honestly. If you want to take those out, they're they're terrible. Breath of the Wild or Mario Odyssey? Um, I have not gotten to play much of Mario Odyssey, so I'm gonna have to say Breath of the Wild. Right. I'm a big farmer. I've never played WoW, <laughs> never played WoW, but I love farming for different things. So collecting yeah. items in Zelda is like my ball game. I love it so much. Fair enough. Two more. Okay. Favorite con or conference of the year? Ooh, that's hard. Personal, I would say my favorite is Dragon Con. Yeah! <laughs> Correct <Yay>! answer! <laughs> it is so much fun. I've only gotten to go once, and it, I had such a blast. I got to meet these amazing celebrities, which was so cool because I'm such a fangirl. And I got to dress up, so I got to do like my Battlestar Galactica costume and my Uhura costume from Star Trek, and it was <laughs> so cool. Like, I haven't cosplay in forever. And it, it was just... It was enjoyable. Like there was so many people there and everybody loves the same things that you do and nobody was angry or fighting and like everyone just seemed to be there to enjoy life in the moment. Uh, I might volunteer to get off of this podcast so Shannon can be here every week because she is <laughs> she's spot on with all of these takes. So you far. just validated everything Kishore's ever said about Dragon. <laughs> and last thing, your nickname your youtube channel is called the snubs report oh, where yeah. does snubs come from oh man it's uh it's an old it's an oldie but a goodie i in high school when aim first started and all that stuff am i showing my age you mean yet? aim aim yeah yeah yes. sure aim the now defunct aim we yeah, like exactly. when when def, when aim went when up we all talked about around. our usernames yeah so i needed a good username so me and my friend came up with snubsy boo which was kind of a play <laughs> off of like, there was this girl at school who called herself Chubbs. And I was like, well, I don't want people at school to like make fun of me and call me chubby, like, you know, Chubbs. So I was like, Snubsy Boo, I like that. And you know, it's kind of cute, but at the same time, it's kind of badass. So Snubsy Boo. It's the boo and at the end that really yeah, made it. Yeah, exactly. But over time, it shortened to Snubsy and then Snubs. So now if Snubs is taken online, I just use Snubsy for whatever new social network that pops up. Good luck now. Now know, that right? it's out there. Right? The run on Snubsy.org, Snubsy.net. It's okay. Forget already, about it. I already, it's, it's, I already got Snubsy.com. That's all I care about. Just mentioning trying to choose a, a name name reminds me that <clears throat> now my uh, trying to find an email address that is still available is so hard. Oh, it's so like, hard. I'm trying to find one for my kids just to reserve it now, mm-hmm. just so they'll have it. My wife takes uh, reservations at a restaurant, and she says she can tell how old the person is based on how normal the email address is. Uh, you know, if they have like, you know, an actual name as their email address. That's an interesting conundrum. I don't have kids, so I never thought about that, but you're you're right. That's going to be an issue going forward. Well, we saw all the email you know, servers, all the email um, hosts. Yeah. B- when they were born, yeah. we could sign up for whatever we wanted. Yeah, exactly. But now it's all kind of established, you know, you got Gmail, Yahoo. It's true. Oh, the laments of old people on the internet. Yeah, I know. Here, here it comes. Us old people. Well, Shannon, thanks for coming in this week. Uh, yeah, thank and you. We're going to cut right to the biggest news story of last week. We d- we don't need the, the transition music yet. But because, it works this week. No, but we're coming to the transition right. music. Because the biggest news story of last week, how did you guys feel when it was revealed that Diet Coke is coming out with new flavors? What are you talking about? <laughs> is this true? <laughs> is this true? I mean, what happened in your life? Do you remember where you were when this news dropped? It happened during the podcast. Diet Coke has pivoted towards millennials. What are you talking about? But people already drink it just for the taste of it, right? Wow. That was like an actual slogan of theirs. 
Is it not anymore? Just for yeah. the taste are of they it. Make, what is it, like cherry now? Is it, what are they doing? It, they've made five new flavors. Feisty cherry. Oh, my. There's like a or, ginger lime one. There's some orange one. And they released one of the cringiest videos ever about playing to millennials. And it's like just interviewing millennials and be like, what do you feel when you drink this? Mm. They, they didn't have like a Kardashian handing a soda to a cop, did they? No. But okay. they redesigned the cans <laughs> to look like Red Bull cans. Oh, uh, because that shape really speaks to the millennial oh, they're, generation. They're small. Wow. Yeah. Well, they're that tall and narrow. Oh, but same amount, 12 ounce, whatever. I don't right. know. But, uh, right. but I'm going to do a live taste test when the products come out by the end of the month. I'll taste it here first. Hot Diet Coke takes here on the podcast. That's a real sponsorship I'm, opportunity. I'm so excited for you right now. <laughs> So excited. The millennial inside of me is going to come bursting out with joy. Okay, <laughs> on to our tech news. Oh, now I get to play the music. Uh, for those that want more Diet Coke information, there's a great story in the Atlantic about their declining sales revenue and uh, lost leadership, and that's why water is becoming the new soda of 2018. Wow. Okay, <laughs> enough of that. <laughs> You're such a nerd. <laughs> I am a huge soda nerd. Uh, CES was last week. Um, as you put it, it was a shit show. Yes. This is, how many years have you been going, Shannon? Uh, so I, I calculated it wrong, and I tweeted that it was my ninth year. It's actually my 10th year. This was my 10th time going to CES straight in a row. So why was it? Kill a, me. Why was it a shit show? <laughs> you did not seem to have a great show this year. I didn't. Well, unfortunately, it, it was just me and my co-host Patrick Norton. So it was just us that went to the show, and we were trying to cover as much as we could uh, in as short amount of time as possible. So other than like booking interviews with people, I didn't get to see a lot on the show floor because I was so busy getting B-roll, doing edits, shooting stand-ups, and then editing and uploading everything from the media room because that's the only place where you could get a good upload so it was uh it was hard to take time for myself to just go out and wander and one of my favorite parts about going to ces is just being able to wander around the show floor and see all the new technology so i still got to see a lot just because i had those interviews planned but i didn't get to see as much as i usually do so that was kind of unfortunate so while we were recording last week the blackout happened yep what was the blackout like that was, uh, yeah, that was interesting. So as I mentioned, I had an interview planned and it was with Panasonic to talk about their new Lumix GH5S, which as you probably know, is a low light camera. <laughs> so, so you thought it was all just part of the whole demonstration. Well, it happened and we were like in the middle, oh yeah, this can do like 25,000 ISO, blah, blah, blah. And then the lights go out and I was just like, huh, okay, um, well, why don't we take this camera out onto the show floor before they kick me out? Because I'm not a vendor. So so I got to walk around the booth and I was shooting with this Panasonic camera and I was like, oh, it's pretty good in low light. Okay. How dark was it? It was, uh, it was pretty dark. It was like, I would say the only thing you could see was daylight coming in from some windows. Mm. Uh, otherwise, there were a few booths that had their own generators for electricity, but for the most part, everything else was dark. So you could still see, like, you could still see people. Like, I could see you s standing right next to me yeah. from the daylight from windows. But otherwise, it was it was nothing like what you would normally see CES like. It was like everybody closed down at the end of the day <laughs> so and was leaving. Did people start to hoop and holler? Was there... No, it just went quiet. Oh, wow. It was so eerie. It was like zombie apocalypse type quiet. Like <laughs> everybody was just like, hushed, what happened? And everyone started looking around like, um, who's in charge? Right. Who do we go to? <laughs> Nobody was sure. And one of the scary things too, I was listening to some B-roll later that day when I was doing an edit and it was at a completely different booth and I don't know who this guy was working for, but I heard him in the background and I was totally messing with the audio so that I could listen in on his conversation. But he said that they lost about $1 million in profit from the two hours that the power was out. What? That gives you an idea of how much those booths charge, or are charged to have a booth at CES. N that and, much money? And it makes sense because some of the smaller booths cost $80,000. 
Oh my goodness. Isn't that insane? That is totally insane. I know. I didn't know the power out was out that long. Yeah, two hours for the central hall. And of course I was panicking because I was like, I have so much to do. What do I do? Oh my yeah. God. You know, I was just like <laughs> breaking my mind and getting a headache from the stress, but everything was fine. You know, after two hours or so, they put the lights back on. Of course they were like, oh, it's cause the water from the rain the other day made the power go out, but it's okay. Everything's good now. So I don't know. There might be like a lawsuit from uh, some of the vendors because of the lost profits, because that's a lot of advertising re revenue and like a lot of trades and a lot of exhibitors that are losing that money. I also wondered with so many prototype products, what it was like that first hour when the power came back on, because it's mm. not like these products are necessarily designed to handle power outages in yeah. their current stage. And so if if we just saw a bunch of people like struggling to get their stuff back online, yeah. if it was chaos that first hour. A lot of it was chaos um, for me from an audience standpoint because uh, the, the CTA, the people that run CES, they were trying to block traffic from coming back into the hall. So they were kind of pushing everybody out and then slowly letting people trickle back in as the power came back on. Um, as far as the booths are concerned, I know a lot of the equipment that they were using took a long time to boot back up because they had to resync a lot of the audio and the vi visuals and stuff like that. So um, I didn't see any prototypes fail from my own personal standpoint, but I did see a lot of very slow reboots happening. Which is I, sad for 2018. I did see one 3D printer that was advertised as as being able to pick up its print mm, yeah. in, in case there was an outage and it just like just kept going. It was yeah. great. It was kind of perfect <laughs> for what, what their product was designed for. Um, beyond the blackout though, there are still good things that come out of CES. Yeah, totally. Um, anything that, that stood out to you as, as favorite items or, or themes that emerged uh, that you think are interesting going forward? I did see a lot of themes. Um, because iPhones are now using wireless technology for charging, we are finally seeing a lot of vendors introducing wireless charging like accessories, mm -hmm. which they have just not been doing up until now because Androids, I guess, don't matter. I have a Pixel, if you can tell. I'm an Android girl. But uh, finally, we're getting to see these with like Qi chargers, which is great. I'm really excited about that. So I saw there was also a story about... Um uh, about charging via Wi-Fi too for mm. a device, which is novel to use Wi-Fi in that way, and I can't imagine what the actual charging capability <laughs> over Wi-Fi would be. I, but yeah. I heard about this years ago when they were first tinkering with the technology. But you could only siphon just like a tiny little bit of power. Right. It wasn't yeah. even like a, you could maybe light an LED, maybe. Yeah, I'm wondering if you think that would be useful. I feel like if you went to a Starbucks and it had wi-fi charging yeah and even if it just sort of kept you static so if you entered at like 50 percent, you'd leave starbucks at 50 percent. if, the, if yeah. that way is that meaningful <laughs> i don't know well i don't know if i would use it i did see that technology my friend got to try it and he was able to walk away with a uh, a device that he was trying to charge and it worked for several several feet away from the the wireless uh, uh access point mm -hmm. so it worked great this year, which is excellent. Hmm. But personally, I don't think I would use it because I don't like connecting to wireless that I'm uh, not in charge of. So whether it's work or home, I don't connect to anything outside of that, especially like coffee shop Wi-Fi, because my company made the product that takes advantage of that security issue. So, so what you have to be connected to is actual access point like you you can't just absorb the radio frequencies without actually i don't connecting think to the wi -Fi. so i'm pretty sure you have to hmm. connect to the actual wireless access point hmm. but i could be wrong so don't quote me on that well i guess if you host a, a show called threat wire maybe yeah. public wi-fi spy <laughs> yeah not, not <laughs> for you uh i wonder if chi charging is going to take off with iphone users because even all the iphone 10 users that i know iphone x whatever um <laughs> Uh, none of them have purchased those accessories. Yeah, at this I, point, I don't know anybody. I think a lot of them, them yet. are waiting for apples because they they announced that they were making their big wide one and they would be out sometime this year. Do you guys remember the Nexus devices, the yeah. Nexus phones, and the really cool wireless charger that they had, the little circular one? Yeah. I love that thing. It was I had so that thing. Cool. It was great. Me too. Yeah, it was, it was great. great. And then I got a phone that doesn't have wireless charging anymore, and I I really do miss it. I loved being able to wireless charge my phone. Especially in the bedroom, because then just like mm -hmm. leaving your your phone on the nightstand on yeah. top of the pad, that was great. It, its use case 
you know, at the office and, and you know, on the go yeah. is less so for me. Like seeing it integrated into like Starbucks where they like, you know, embed a Qi charger yeah, in totally. the table. I think that's a little less useful. But that nightstand use case uh, I thought was wonderful. And it's something you use once a day. Yeah. Um, I, I do. I do miss the Qi charging. I understand why it went away in a lot of phones. But, you know, as as you say, Jeremy, the thickness of the phone isn't a big deal anymore. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, I would love to see that coming back. What other themes that came out? Um, of course, we saw a lot of really nice TV technology, but I'm not a big TV guru, so I don't really delve into those. I feel like we've passed a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Like we, we have 4K HDR uh, on the consumer level now mm-hmm. in stores that looks good. I don't get why folding t- roll-up TVs and like these... I actually have a good use case scenario for a roll-up, for a roll-up TV? TV. Yes, I do. But it's not for consumers. It's for B2B. So if you are a vendor like going to a convention and you need to transport a television, it would be much easier to roll one up and ship it like in a poster container as opposed to taking a TV and like putting that in a giant cardboard box. And I feel like if you were able to bring that and then like unroll it at your booth and then show off whatever display information that you need yeah. uh, for your customers, and then you could roll it back up at the end of the night and put it, it uh, like protected in your hotel room or something, way nicer than having to tote around a gigantic TV with you everywhere that you go. Now that's a very, very small that's a limited use, use case. case scenario, but it is something that I noticed because I, I vend at DEF CON every year for hack five and i was like wow i wish i had that for defcon that would be amazing i think there's a, like the whole pico projector market is the mm-hmm. same kind of thing it's just anybody who wants portability over yeah quality yeah but otherwise like if, if maybe if you have kids and you don't want them to knock over your tv but is is that a problem like i don't know <laughs> my cats don't knock over my tv and they always like check it out whenever there's birds on the screen so <laughs> it's, it's not worth the factor of price i think the technology is totally interesting yeah that it has that sort of flexibility built into the product but i don't see a use case at home for having a flexible thing outside yeah. of we nope. talked about it for for tabletop gaming like being able to roll it out on a table last week but outside oh, of yeah. that i don't see much for cool. it. yeah vr was also really fun at ces do tell so my favorite thing that I got to try was the HTC Vive Pro, mm-hmm. which I'm sure, because y'all are all into VR here, I'm sure you got to check out the HTC Vive Pro 2. No, Have you no, tried we, it out we, yet? We weren't at CES. You so. haven't gotten to see it? No. <gasps> oh, yeah, we're, it's really nice. Yeah. It's really cool. I like it. Have you, how did it feel? Yeah, that's the first question. It was very comfortable. And I have glasses, so I was really worried about that. And it, uh, I also worry because my head's kind of wide so (laughs) i didn't want the little headphones to hurt my ears and it was very comfortable so i was really happy with that the um peripheral vision i feel like could be better because it it doesn't go as that far it's it's very similar to the original htc vive but the vive pro resolution has increased a lot Mm -hmm. just like noticeably so for you noticeably so Mm -hmm. like uh with the original if you're looking at text on the screen you kind of have to squint because you see all those pixels and if it's if it's very thin lines of text it's very hard to understand like what you are reading unless you like kind of finagle with the head uh the headset and you kind of got to move it around and make sure that it's positioned correctly so that you can see everything in front of you but i was able to read text very clearly on the screen and it looked a lot more realistic like i had an android come at me in raw data and i jumped back literally jumped back which i never do in vr gaming because it looks so real and i was like oh god there's an android right behind me and then i gave it a headshot which was great did you get a chance to try the wireless adapter i did not i saw the wireless adapter it looks awesome because that is one of my issues with uh vr gaming is being having to be sure. tethered because i it always bothers me whenever that thing touches me because i feel like it's a bug and i'm like no there's a thing on me <laughs> it freaks me out well, it can just be a pain to manage too just like yeah. are you tripping over your cable or staying in the game oh yeah totally so i read somebody's review of it where they said they noticed a little bit of latency you know, it was the kind oh, of thing where some people, that. some people wouldn't, some people might. Oh, with the wireless one, you exactly. Mean? Oh, okay, yeah. And uh, so it was just, he said it's the smallest bit. Yeah. But it's the kind of thing you might end up feeling, rather than actually noticing. Yeah. Uh, it re- you know resulting in some kind of motion sickness, but that may have just been because it was in CES. You know, with all the congestion. That's true. I'm, 
it, you would really need to test it in like a home office yeah. or a studio or something like that away from so much wireless congestion because like if you pull up wi-fi analyzer while you're at ces it's insane oh my like God. there is so much crap happening at that convention hall now granted that it is like a 60 gigahertz signal that they're using for that yeah. wireless transmission so that's not going to be terribly congested mm -hmm. but who knows i mean there's so much radio frequency stuff going on yeah totally how was the sound the sound was very good too. Um, I noticed that there's two different options with the HTC Vive Pro where you can either have it so that it um, kind of envelops you in the game or you leave it so you can hear what's going on around you in the real world. Uh, I'm pretty sure mine was set so that you could hear what's going on in the real world because there was a PR guy talking to me. So I wasn't able to like suck myself into the game as far as the sound goes. So I can't say like, oh, it was amazing or not because that's how they had it running at that, uh, at that demo. I think the, the key to those headphones is they have to sound just good enough. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Pro Audio headset for the Vive sounds good enough as is the Enough. Rift headset. <laughs> what is your sense about price for the uh, Vive Pro? I don't know. I'm worried. How much is the original? It's like six, seven, uh, I want to say it's, uh, yeah, I want to say 600. 600 sound right? 600 now. But okay. it that, came out at 800. That's for the everything, okay. right? That's for the lighthouses and the controllers. Oh, that's right. Yeah, okay. Um, I don't know. I'm worried that the new one, just the headset alone, is going to be like 800 bucks. Oh, my God. That's what I said last week. Most of the commenters said, They've heard rumors that it'll be sub five hundred. Like even somebody that would be awesome. Somebody saying it'll be three fifty. That um, would be great, especially if you skeptical. have an original HTC Vive and you could just like upgrade the headset and not have to upgrade the rest of the equipment. I think they've said That'd that's awesome. how they'll sell it. Yeah, it, yeah. So, so I, I'm hoping for five hundred bucks. I'm hoping it's under that price point because I would totally buy one. And just because it's fun, anything ridiculous from CES that you want to mention? Ooh. Like, I saw the ping pong robot. Oh, my God. Which was oh, there yeah. for its second year. Want. That was cool. That was very cool. And actually, it, it looks incredible. How they're yeah. able to map that using just optical sensors, that yeah. the visual play field. And I saw it play against somebody that was hitting the ball fast. Really? Uh, against the robot. And it was, oh. it was there. Mm -hmm. It's like how with chess, though. It's like, what an enjoyable game. Like, I saw. Yeah, um, not really. There was this thing that got a lot of press, but nobody mentioned how janky it was. It was this luggage that's supposed to follow you. I saw this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was so dumb. But <laughs> I, I wish that it would work. But right now, it's super janky. Like every time I went back there to record it and get it on camera, following somebody around the convention center, the thing would just stop and it would disconnect, and then it would run into people. <laughs> And I was just like, well, I guess they got a little bit of work to do before yeah. this happens. But yeah, it was it was a carry-on size luggage with a battery built in and wheels, and it was robotic so that it would follow you through a, a crowd, and you would wear this little bracelet on your hand that would pair with it so it could recognize you out of all the people in an airport. Like okay. Bluetooth, it would connect to it? Yeah, exactly. And so that's why it would drop constantly. It would just drop constantly, and then it would either stop or it would try to connect again, and then it would rush towards you and ram into your legs. And I was just like, <laughs> I like the idea that it speeds up when it reconnects. Is like, oh no, <laughs> so no, funny, like, like a scared child. And every single time it happened, like I felt bad for the journalists that were trying to get this on camera while they were like interviewing the people because they were just standing there, like, well, <sighs> this is taking a while. That's not this how the articles happen. presented it. A no. lot of articles presented it like, isn't this an amazing... This is amazing. No, yeah. and the thing like sucked on carpet. So they, they kept on showing it, demoing it on, on nothing but concrete because the wheels wouldn't work on carpet. And they couldn't give me a price point. And then they said that it's, it would weigh less than four kilograms. And I was like, that's really lightweight. I don't know if that's true. I, I can't believe that... It well, would be four kilograms. Luckily, there's no carpet in airports, so this will never be a there problem. There is carpet in I, airports. I know. There's carpet everywhere There's in carpet in the Oakland airport. I know that because I got a roller cart, and it never works right. <sighs> Segway released something. At least as far as I know, it was announced at CES. Basically, you know the new Segway that's just as like, knee height? It's tiny. You know the one? No. Well, it's it's Segway, but you... I think you, we have it. Do you, we still have it yeah, over there? Yeah, we still have it. You don't hold it with your hands anymore. You just stand on it, and you sort of steer by leaning your, your oh, knees wait, left and right. Oh, wait. Did I try that thing? Yeah, you tried it here. Okay, I thought so. Well, now... I didn't know that was a Segway one. When when they sold the company, so now it's a new oh. company that's taken over. So now, when you get off the Segway, it can now become autonomous, and it can follow you around, much like... Why, why would you like want that feature? 
Well, the the pitch is if you go, you ride the Segway to the grocery store, you then put your groceries on the Segway, and the Segway follows you home. That's. <laughs> It's a really weird use case. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it was it, the problem was the people who tried it at CES found that if they put the groceries on, uh, it, and it leaned back, it thought it was like oh, trying no. to stop, so it didn't work. They had to put it on sideways, so they have some problems to solve. Yeah, but you know, interesting, interesting. Is this follow technology actually useful? This is the, the Segway is doing it optically. So there's, I like the Bluetooth idea because mm-hmm. the thing, who optical stuff just isn't there yet. Yeah, but I think I'm more confident about long-term optical. Yes, yes. Because of what's happening with cars yeah, uh, and how quickly that seems to be advancing because Bluetooth is always going to suffer from interference too. Mm -hmm. Or hacks. Yeah, exactly. Hacking luggage. Mm-hmm. The new wave. <laughs> well, I could imagine, like, if somebody saw your your luggage following you around in the airport and they had the correct hardware, I won't mention what the hardware is, but they could totally find the frequency that it's working on and intercept it and then have your luggage go somewhere else. Heck yeah. Like, it's, it's not that hard to do. And <laughs> I can imagine some really good trolling if that happened. Uh, I'm going to troll you for a second because I watched an episode of Tech Thing at from CES where you got out the smart water bottle with oh, the infusion yeah. button and you look like you actually were trying to promote this thing with a straight face <laughs> and Patrick would not let you do it. Oh, and I'm man. here to tell you that was one of the worst things I've seen. That was so funny. <laughs> so funny. This is a, a water bottle that you hit a button on and it has flavors that get yeah. injected into the water. <laughs> yeah. It has like three different flavor options and then they inject into the water and you can specify like how much of the flavoring you want it to inject into the water for you, depending on like how much water is currently in the water bottle and it can connect to your Fitbit and all this stuff. Okay, so the reason no, why no, Shannon. the reason why hold up. <laughs> the reason why I thought it was cool is because I don't like the taste of just plain water. And I'm always, (laughs) shut up. (laughs) I don't like the taste of plain water. I always mix in like the Mm. little lemon crystal things or whatever, Mm -hmm. tang or whatever it might be. And yes, I like tang too. And so I was like, oh, that's cool. I think it's neat. Would I ever use it? Probably not. Especially like the way you had to load it in. It was like almost this like you know, yeah. inhaler bottle that you would stick in the <laughs> bottom of it. It was so weird. Looking. Well, it's supposed to last like 64 drinks or something, 64 like full bottles per uh, capsule. So it would last a really long time. So you wouldn't have to refill it like every single day or something like that, which is nice. But yeah. yeah. Is it, it like a press button for every sip or per container? Like you fill it per, up, press it container. once and you're done. Per container. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Right. Sounds all right. I don't know. That one made me. Uh, that one was the most. He's skeptical. so skeptical. I was pretty skeptical of that. Uh, anything that you walked away from CS being like, oh, I, I either want that or that's going to be something in 2018 that we're going to cover a lot more of. Um, VR, the Vive Pro was definitely something that I was like, I, I totally want to get one of those. It came out um, of nowhere. Yeah, it, it really did come out of nowhere. It was really, really cool. NVIDIA had some really awesome technology they were showing off. Like they had these uh, BFGDs, I think they were calling them, big format gaming displays. Oh, the big 4K 55 inch things. Yeah. Yeah. They were gorgeous. <laughs> it's crazy for a computer. 1,000 nits. Com- giant computer monitors, huge, big enough to be a TV. And yeah. you would just sit in front of it and have these amazing nits, so amazing brightness and yeah. awesome HDR quality, 4K. But like, it's beyond your field of view. Man. <laughs> right? Well, no, if you sit back far enough, it's fine. But who's sitting back that far from their gaming display? Yeah. Well, if you have like a dude cave, go for it. All right, fine. <laughs> but that, those seemed over the top because they must they have been. They were over the top. They must have been so expensive, too. I don't know. The cool thing, thing is the G-Sync support. So like you get that whatever frame rate your computer can pump out, like yeah. it'll support it. Yeah, exactly. The G-Sync quality onto it. And I've played both. I've played the same game on a monitor without G-Sync and then with G-Sync, and you do see a difference. Like it's not just some gimmicky thing, but like playing playing a game without G-Sync, you see tearing in the, in the background, and you see tearing whenever there's a lot of movement on the screen. And then you turn on that G-Sync, and it's so fluid, and it's so buttery. Like there's a... There's a huge difference between not using it and using it. So, like, I'm a convert, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) 
All right. Well, Shannon's going to take out a second mortgage to buy an <laughs> apparently. <laughs> a, a high end gaming Not, I wish I wish the CES stuff would actually give us price points and like release dates because you always see all this awesome new technology and who knows if it'll actually come out next I year. I mean, half the stuff doesn't actually turn into a consumer product. Yeah. it seems like just a lot like of it is just like prototypes, and they're like, "Oh, check out this cool new thing! Look what we can do." We rolled up a TV. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's going to hit the market. Um, any last thoughts about CES 2018? Uh, it was it was tiring. I ended up with the con crud, if you can't tell from my voice. So <laughs> I came back and I was like, next year, I'm only going if I got a sponsor, an editor, and a camera person. <laughs> that's Because I am too old to be lugging around my camera equipment on my own. Oh, that must have been quite the backpack. Yeah, it was. It was very heavy. Or just do what we do and don't go. And <laughs> ask somebody who did to come on your show and fill you in. Right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> You're welcome. We, we yeah. say that Norm will be back at CES <laughs> next year. I'm sure of it. <laughs> the only reason he's not at CES is that they're down shooting something at Weta. If you haven't checked out Still Untitled this week, uh, Adam, Norm, and Joey uh, do a report from New Zealand where they talk a little bit about the projects they're working on down there. And there's a few secretive things, but they did mention that they are actively shooting something with Weta and that that content will be out soon. Cool. Yeah, I can't wait to talk to them about this. Oh, the, I, the photos on Twitter alone have been more than tantalizing. They talked about uh, um, flying in World War I planes and having like a simulated dogfight yeah. uh, chase. And I what? think Norm and Adam both posted photos from that um, experience on their uh, on their Twitter feeds and they're gorgeous. I actually don't know how Norm got some of the shots because there's one of a plane chasing his plane yeah. and you can see the p- propeller really clearly. Yeah, it looks like tilt shift in, in the air or something. It's yeah. wild. I have no idea what kind of shutter speed he had going on to get the propeller like that. Oh, cool. Um, but it was pretty amazing. So we're going to hear some amazing stories coming out of that. Uh, let's quickly go through um, a few other tech stories that, that came out. Yep. Um, uh, so let's say you're like an engineer <laughs> in Hawaii. Are you on vacation? Or do you live no, there? I think you live there. <laughs> you live there? Okay. You live there and you're just trying to test out like, you know, communication yeah. systems. Right. And you have this janky interface with, with a drop down menu. Really janky. <laughs> and you and you select the real missile alert versus the, the fake <laughs> missile alert. No oh big God. deal. No, you can just hit recall on that. Did you right? see what he, what he actually had to click? Because so the 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 button that he had to click said uh, PACOM CDW state only drill. He accidentally clicked PACOM state you know CDW state only. So oh, I saw no. I saw a report that that screenshot that we saw no, that's is manufactured. not is manufactured. But it was confirmed that it's it's close enough. It, it does indicate what it looks like. Oh, so it is this ridiculous, like, wow. Netscape-esque version of the internet, like, blue underlying links. Wait, it, it's just that they're I so similar. I built that similar. website on GeoCities. <laughs> wow. Yeah, they're so similar. There's yeah. no differentiation between the two. And dude just clicked the wrong It was supposed one. to be an internal test that no one was supposed to receive any kind of notification. Yeah. So my sister lives in Hawaii, and she immediately sent us a screenshot of what she saw on her phone and the M- emergency alert. Meaning, like, um, we're all going to die? Basically, yeah. She was just like, what do I do? Um, her husband's a Marine, and she was like, oh my he, God. he was told by their entire Marine uh, crew, I guess, I don't know what yeah. they're called. <laughs> I'm, I'm from a military family. I should know this. But they were all told... Uh, to stay in shelter, shelter in place. So they were like, we have to stay in our house. We brought in all of our animals. Like she has a dog and she was like, we have to stay here. And for, you know, almost 40 minutes, they had no clue what was going on. She was so pissed. But of course, course. and she never received, she never received another message saying, sorry, it's okay. Everything's fine. So if she didn't have some kind of connection, she would have never had known. How how did she figure it out? Because her husband, he got a call oh, from okay. somebody else in the Marines. So so they were like, oh, everything's okay. All right, we're good. We can go back outside. But And then she started sending us memes, of course, because she has a sense of humor, which is wonderful. Well, she's happy. She's alive. I yeah, would imagine. I and she's pregnant. So oh I was God. just like, oh, wow. Way to put like a bunch of stress on everybody that lives in Hawaii. I was, I was panicking because, you know, oh. I don't want to lose my soon-to-be niece i i saw hawaii trending on twitter and i was like oh what's going on in hawaii and i was like oh no <laughs> yeah uh it look it it was scary it was, it was very, very scary. scary um 
and it's just disappointing. That's what systems look like. Yeah. From a design perspective, I think I've seen a lot of designers come out of the woodwork, be like, and just shaking their heads. Mm-hmm. Um, and what that looks like, but it's also scary because it erodes your confidence in other disaster systems. Yeah. And how vulnerable they might be, especially in an age when. Uh, there's more talk about that than in the past 20 years. I think we yeah. we all grew up in a time that, that there was the drill where you went underneath your desk at school mm-hmm. um, for those drills. And it's it it was weird to like talk about my talk with my kid about those days. Yeah, because I've told I've largely forgotten about that time. But that we was have, a freaky time period. We have the siren that goes off every week here in the city. Yeah, mm-hmm. Tuesdays at noon. At noon. Yeah. Whenever we have visitors in town, my wife is sure to tell them. Yeah, it's just a drill. Because it sounds straight up Half Life too. Like when the, when the voice comes on, yeah. <laughs> I'm from the Midwest, so every time I hear the sirens go off here, the the weekly test or the monthly test, whatever it is, um, I when I first moved here, I thought it was a tornado siren, and I was like, I thought we don't get tornadoes in San Francisco. Right. What's going on? And then my my co-host was or my coworker was like, Oh well, um, they do those for like in case of tsunamis and and war and stuff like that. And I was like, Uh. That's a little freaky. Wow. Cool. All right. Well, there's no way to segue out of this story, so we're going to go back to just talking about segue itself. <laughs> um, the Robo Hoverboard, Jeremy, that you wanted to talk about? The I already did talk about this. Wait, is that? Yeah, this is the segue that, that, oh, that's that the follows lo- you home. But it has a face on it, too? Well, it, it's... I don't know. It, I don't... It apparently has, like, a dog-like face. Does it? Like, oh. on the little screen? Yeah. Yes. I mean, I think it's it does look at you. It does follow you. That's By the it. way, did you see the new Ibo at CES? Sony's puppy no, robot. I missed out on the Ibo. It looks so cute, though. It has OLED screens now for its eyes. Smart. Yeah. Smart. I don't know. <laughs> you still have to pay like a monthly service for your <laughs> robot what? pet. That's crazy. Yeah, you have to pay like twenty five dollars a month to connect to like their cloud service. Well, to enable your robo. Puppy. I guess that's that's about the same price as dog food so <laughs> yeah. pets are expensive yeah <laughs> pets are expensive <laughs> thanks for the hot take jeremy yeah. uh supreme court will be revisiting a big case coming up um related to south dakota and related to you my friend oh well, yeah this is definitely related to me everybody so uh, how do you guys feel about sales tax do you like to pay it uh, no one wants to pay you more know, tax. You know, yeah, but you say that, but you also want to live in a nice place. No, yes, that's how it, my initial reaction is like, hey, do you want to pay more tax? Of course the answer is no. Mm-hmm. But then you sit back and you realize, okay, this tax it pays for all sorts of services. And so the idea of sales tax for products I buy over the internet, whether they come across state lines or not, it makes sense that I pay sales tax for them. For a while there, we only paid sales tax uh, for, from companies that had a physical presence in your state. Right. right? Um, and Amazon now has a presence everywhere. So like mm-hmm. they charge sales tax to just about everybody. But apparently this dates back to a 1992 ruling from a mail order business um, where it was, the, the case was Quill versus North Dakota. And that's when they established this, this rule that, that lasts until this very day, where we only pay sales tax to certain companies, the ones that have a presence in our state. But they, um, you know, they have, the Supreme Court has now accepted this case, and they will be rethinking this. And it's possible that sales tax will be something we're all paying no matter what. Yeah, that makes sense to me, though, because even if the product is produced in another state, when it's being shipped to you, it's still using infrastructure within the state that you reside. Right, yeah. So yeah. why would it... Why wouldn't it go to those services? I get that it's not the same type of infrastructure if the if the company was in state, but it's still using something. I'm right? all for it. I'm all for it because I, I I do think that the government needs more money for the infrastructure. Let them build out the roads. It, give it, give us better internet. It's I also a weird hate loophole. Paying sales tax. I hate it so much. But I've I've kind of gotten to the point where everything I buy online has a sales tax on it anyway because yeah. it's California. And everybody resides here, apparently. There, there was a nice party for about 10 years there. There was a yeah. nice party. When I lived in the Midwest and nothing was taxed and I was just <laughs> buying all sorts of things on the internet, it was wonderful. TVs, but, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I bought a TV. I bought my wedding dress and had it shipped to my mom because they go. didn't charge sales tax for that. Wedding dress tax free. Yeah, dude. It was great. Now, That's some states do. don't have sales tax. Yeah. Yeah. So will that be the case for them that they don't pay sales tax still? I, I don't mm. know how that would work. So, like, if you live Might in be a technicality. Oregon that doesn't have sales tax, I don't know. I'm making that up. I don't know if Oregon does or not. Uh, and you buy a product from California. Yeah. That's a great question. Mm-hmm. Someone knows. 
He'll let us know. Um, all right. One thing we haven't talked about that was a big feature of CES and, and just a big story in general is autonomous cars moving forward. And we have some news out about Google essentially really making some forays at, with Way- Waymo, chasing down some of their competitors. Uh, first of all, Waymo is back in San Francisco. Did you know that? No. Wasn't they, it down the, well, in the no, valley? They, no, they, they, they developed it here. This was like where the, they were born. But then they have officially launched in five other cities or uh, around the country. But they've recently been spotted back here in San Francisco. They say that they're just doing it to test out the hills and the, and the fog and to get the conditions so that the computers can learn better. But, uh, you know, maybe this is going to be one of their new cities that they open up in. But, yeah, I guess there's this company. Um, what, what are they called? It's a research company, right? Yeah. Uh, um, I can't find it. But they rate all of the automated car manufacturers based on how well they're doing on execution and strategy. And this year, uh, GM is in the lead. Be- they, and they famously uh, just last week announced um, a Bolt that will be coming out next year with no steering wheel. Wow. No, no pedals either, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, why? Why pedals? <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> it's like you can't steer out of this, <laughs> yeah. but you can stop the car. Maybe there'll be a button, like an emergency stop button. But uh, so they are at the forefront of that. And then right behind them is Waymo. Uh, so Google, despite not having any consumer product on the horizon, um, they're, they're right at the top, right next to GM. And way at the bottom, who would have thought Tesla? Really? Yeah. Huh. They, they rate them in different categories. They have leaders which you have Waymo and GM and a bunch of new players uh, this year too, uh, Volkswagen, BMW, Ford, they're all leaders now. Then they have contenders, which is like um, Toyota and some other co- car companies that are getting their feet wet. And then they have challengers, and that includes Tesla, Uber, Apple, wow. Honda. No, um, but yeah, no one I, seems to know what Apple's doing. I w- that, that's true, yeah, yeah. Uh, but who knows what Waymo's doing? I mean, they're all trying to get At least done. they have vehicles out on the no, road. No, you're right, you're right. And so there is some evidence of what's going on. The uh, What's weird is I don't live that far from here. I live you know, in the, in the center of San Francisco, and I ran an errand on my way over here. I saw four different test autonomous vehicles on, en route here. You're kidding. Um, no, <laughs> I'm not. One was in a Target parking lot. Uh, driving around one was uh, and the other three were just driving the streets so um, we're in this weird phase where there's test cars out everywhere and when I I was I'm from Pittsburgh and when I was back home last year I saw a bunch um, there as well and not Mm -hmm. just the uber cars that are enabled Uh, so I I think there's going to be more and more of these test cases. Mm -hmm. right now they're in cities where the engineering is happening but they're gonna have to roll them out to you know phoenix to test what it's like when it's 120 degrees and and you know the conditions in houston with stop and go traffic so have you ever been in one no no i'd love to i i've been in a in a research one i was in a delorean that um could drift autonomously what yeah it was pretty crazy that's cool uh it's an episode on the site but uh you were in a tesla uh, model three well and that's why i was surprised that the tesla is so poorly rated. By the way, the company that did this, uh, that has been doing this chart for years now is Navigant Research. I guess they're, they're well respected. But yeah, I was in a Tesla with autopilot. Have you ever been in a Tesla driving itself on the highway? Yeah. I, well, not on the highway. It was on uh, local roads, but it, it was really cool. I, yeah. It was a Intel Delphi or Delphi mm-hmm. uh, collab car, and they just invited a bunch of people out to check it out and do some videos and interviews and stuff like that. So I got to experience it. And seeing how it interacted with the cars around it, like waiting until it would merge into a lane for a car to pass, and stopping at an intersection so that a pedestrian could walk by and not like ramming into the pedestrian, it was really interesting Mm because it it's a lot more um it takes a lot more time for it to like slow down and do stuff like that than a human would like a human would just be like oh yeah okay stop but this thing's like oh i see it dead ahead so let me slow down really really slowly Mm -hmm. before i actually get to that pedestrian so there's some interesting differences but i didn't feel scared to be in the autonomous vehicle at all i I want i I did i mean and i was just i was just on the highway and i mean you know it's just a, 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 when you're behind the steering wheel yeah. and you're on the highway and you're hitting for a turn and there's a car to your right and mm-hmm. there's a shoulder to your left, it's nerve wracking yeah. not to grab that wheel. Yeah. But I I can only assume it. you get used to it so quickly. Yeah, I would think so. 
I don't know. I would get used. I was, I'm excited. I was like, yes, let's make all the cars autonomous. I'm, I'm so excited. I'm about excited this. too, especially once they can communicate with each other. There's yeah. just going to be this growing pain where we, they can't, mm -hmm. and you're dealing with all the other cars drawn, you know, driven by humans. Mm -hmm. And not compensating for that. I think the communication with e each other is a long way I do off. Too. I do too. The uh, one thing I want to see is we have aggressive pedestrians here in San Francisco. We have some interesting pedestrians that walk in That's multiple true. directions. Yep. And um, don't obey like logical pedestrian flow. Oh, yeah. And I'm really curious what one of these cars, how it would deal with one of those cases. Because, you know, on my way over here, there was definitely... Uh, a person that crossed, stopped in the middle of the road, light turned green, he's still in the middle of the road, walks back, walks the other way. Uh, uh, you know, those edge cases where people yeah. aren't following the rules. Yeah. Um, I'm really curious what these autonomous cars in city conditions look like. And to be clear, this chart is based on level five autonomy. So this, this is this, like this nothing. Is the holy grail. This is this is yeah. fully autonomous with no human input whatsoever. Right. Speaking of the ratings, the Trump administration, um, through Elaine Chao, who's the, uh, uh, she's the Secretary of Transportation or okay or, or something like that, um, announced they'll be revising the autonomous guidelines later oh, this year. Oh, that's right. Yeah, because like with this new Bolt where they don't have a steering wheel, one of the regulations says you have to have a airbag in the steering wheel. Oh. If you don't have a steering wheel, how do you do that? So yeah. they, they need to revise that. Yeah, I wonder how aggressive they're going to be about this. I mean, yeah. the administration's really posited itself as being very pro-business, but like we're in this valley where we don't know what the final thing is going to look like. And I don't think we're at the point where we understand what safety regulations need to be for these cars. We're just not far off along yet. Maybe I'm totally off base here and that there is some idea of what safety is. Um, but also when you're coming up with regulations like this, these regulations underpin liability and insurance mm -hmm. yeah. requirements. So I don't know what their revised guidelines are going to look like. Um, for those that watched the episode of Science and Progress where I was in the DeLorean, it was run by a lab of uh, Chris Gerdes at Stanford who actually was on the task force that was uh, designing these new guidelines um, for the US. We, we spoke briefly about it that day, um, but he was really excited because the revisions uh, are going he thought the revision seemed were going to enable more companies to go a little bit farther and faster in the field uh, if you're curious why tesla wasn't higher rated as i was navigant says this is a quote from their report uh current tesla hardware lacks the ability to keep sensors clean and unobscured in poor weather mm -hmm. as well as the redundant systems needed for fully automated driving and not oh. to mention the lidar which tesla has said they won't use but most manufacturers seem to think LiDAR is crucial Yeah. for a So Tesla product. needs to add little wipers in front of their apparently sensors? So. <laughs> apparently so. That would be the most adorable wipers ever. <laughs> uh, that pretty much wraps it up for tech news this week. You want to roll into the VR Minute? Already? Hot diggity. <laughs> The VR Minute, virtual reality this week. So most of the news is still revolving around reactions to the Vive Pro announcement from last week, mm -hmm. uh, which we've talked about extensively. There's a few other sort of under the radar stories this week. Uh, Nintendo came out with some um, with some statements on VR that reaffirm what we've known about Nintendo stance about sure. VR. Or you might assume. <laughs> I mean, now, th to be fair, they were burned back in the mid-90s with the Virtual Boy. Oh. Now, well, know, how you badly were right. they actually burned by that? Burned, them? dude. They, I don't remember. Did they put a lot of emphasis on that product? They built it. They built the molds. They sold the thing. They put it on shelves. They made the boxes. They put money into the development of the games. Yeah, they were burned. Um, there were like 13 games made for the Virtual Boy. <laughs> anyway, so I y you got to give them respect for that. Like they mm -hmm. they tried it. Um, however, they have come out and said no time soon are they thinking about VR support or 4K support or 4K. Mm. No nope. 4K thing is weird to me. Is it because the Wii didn't support HD? You know, and it was like certainly in the age of HD. They they just let they know they know that that doesn't matter that people play for the games and they, they you know they come for that they love the games if it doesn't support HD it doesn't necessarily mean the game is any worse 
and they can make a cheaper console. Mm -hmm. They don't have to support all this high end tech, and they get bigger penetration. Yeah, that way. I understand not supporting 4K for the current Switch, mm. but if they're saying like whatever next gen console is, which will probably be two, three years away, not supporting 4K by then feels like a mistake. Yeah. I'm not sure that's what they're saying here. Yeah, I don't either. Um, but uh, because by then we have enough adoption, that'd be like them saying like the Wii U is not going to support HD, right? right? Like by the time the Wii U came out, most people had, mm -hmm. or a, there was a huge penetration of, of HD. Um, the Switch streams. barely supports HD. It's mm -hmm. like, it's not even in 1080. Well, but the thing but you is you're looking really on You can notice on such a tiny screen. Like it doesn't matter that much when you're looking yeah. at, at the monitor on that, especially when you're playing something like Zelda, which... Mm -hmm. It is not going to look as nice as like Horizon Zero Dawn, for example. Do you play games on the TV at all using the Switch? I don't. I usually play via the, the Switch handheld as a console. I take it with me mobily, so I don't really play it on the TV anymore. I did when I first got it, and even then, I didn't really... Like, I just have an HD TV, so I don't have mm -hmm. a 4K one, which is unfortunate that I don't yet. But even so, I don't think it would it wouldn't matter that much to me because I love Zelda the game. So even if it wasn't 4K, I'd still play it. Yeah. See, I think it matters not for like the great games on that console right now, like Zelda and Odyssey yeah. and stuff. But if you're playing Rocket League, mm -hmm. Quake, all the games that are being remastered for the Switch, I think then maybe it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. But I still, most of the people I know that have Switches don't play on their TVs anyways. Right. So My, honestly, it doesn't matter. I think the... Uh, what 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 is the word I'm looking for? Like the, the the return from going to 4K from from HD is not as great as going from standard def to to HD. Mm -hmm. And as, when it comes to games, if it's going to cost you X amount of dollars to support it, uh, it's just not worth it to them. They can sell more consoles by staying. I agree, lower it's def. not worth it for Mario and Zelda. Mm. I think three like if they're going to build something, if their next generation thing, there's a lot of ifs in the statement. If their next generation thing is going to be something that's designed to be played on your TV in your living room, <laughs> um, and we're talking three years from now, yeah. because I do think 4K gaming for a lot of games um, that you see that we are playing on the PC now is pretty important. It makes it look a lot better, mm -hmm. um, and that that crisper detail leads to better gameplay. No, no, I don't think so. All right, and and by the way, the the VR support, I'm like, I take your time, Nintendo. I would actually really like it if they did VR support for some of the more popular games. I could imagine having so much fun playing Zelda virtual reality. That would be amazing. It Being be able incredible. to put put yourselves in the shoes. But of it has Link. to work. It has to work. It would perfect, have to work. Yes, perfectly. And I yes. just think that we are still discovering so much about what what works in VR and what mm -hmm. doesn't. That they can take their time and learn from everyone else, and then just knock it out of the park. Yeah. Because whatever Miyamoto does in VR properly this time, not with the virtual yeah. boy, <laughs> is gonna be game changing. I think what'll be interesting is when I think Nintendo, I think great storytelling in games. Yeah. Like I think they will push the boundary of what storytelling in VR games looks like in a way that other studios haven't even thought about. Really? Maybe. Mm. But I, I think the idea of what they could do with Zelda in VR with that mm. game um, might be really fascinating. I just think they get fun. Yeah, <laughs> sure. For, that's, that's another way to put it. Um, okay, there's a new uh, company with something uh, something that I've thought about a little bit. The idea of not just motion tracking, but tracking eyeballs, which we've talked about on the VR Minute a number of times. Did you happen to try any eye tracking stuff at mm. CES? No. no. <laughs> it looks weird. It does. It Actually, you, you can't tell too much that it's in there, but uh, this is a company called Toby, I want to say, T-O-B-I-I, and -I. Gadget covered this, and they said they were really, really excited about it. It's basically, it replaces the eye cups in the Vive, with something that has a bunch of LEDs around the perimeter and a stupid, uh, there's probably a camera in each one, and it can track your eyes. Is it IR LEDs? I would assume like, so, otherwise like, it would be annoying. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> so it's, uh, they they were very bullish on it. They, they seem to think that once you try this, uh, you realize how important it is to VR. And it, it, even at this resolution, like it, it, we should make this a priority, eye tracking. So uh, I know we talked about the Fove headset a lot yeah, yeah. last year. Did you ever get to try it out? No. Okay. Have you? No, no. Um, they they were giving uh, 
uh, examples where they were like throwing something like you have you grab a ball with your control and you throw it yeah um by looking at, at something on the screen it would affect the accuracy of your throw so hmm. you know it would it would almost augment and give you like a superpower of in terms of accuracy but it was also just oh. more it, it felt more natural that way See, I would think the the place that would mean more would be in social interactions. Well, definitely. No, right? absolutely. I, I can't wait for that. Like when, when we've done a podcast in VR, one of these, like a two-hour marathon podcast. Yeah. And I, there's just, there's not the intimacy because you can't make eye contact with people. Yeah, totally. Um, once we have eye tracking and it can at least make me blink when I'm blinking and m actual make mm. some sort of eye contact, okay. it will reduce the, you know, the artificiality of it. And I would okay. love that. I would love that for social. Yeah, I'm starting to get where the eye tracking would come into play. Not necessarily where where I come from, which is a lot of video gaming, mm -hmm. but for the interaction aspect, like you mentioned. Yes. Huh. Yeah, and certainly social. And I just feel like yeah. everything's got to go social in VR. Yeah. Because it's so exciting. It's so much better than regular single player stuff. We have a few quick hitters um, to finish off the the VR minute. Uh, Steam VR beta is offering support for Oculus Dash. I love that they're doing this, this man. This is great. Like, they, <laughs> this thank is, you. They're supporting the competition, and I love that Steam does this. That's I love good. That Vive is is in favor of it. Um, Dash is obviously the uh, the Oculus um, upgrade where you can bring up a dashboard in any game and pull windows out into your game world and um, augment it with the web if you want to, things like that. And it's uh, it's not that you that Dash is not supported by Vive. It's not that at all. It's just that Steam VR games, games on Steam, can now support Dash. Hmm. It's good news. Uh, Oculus announced that if you punch your wall and destroy one of your touch controllers, now you can just buy <laughs> w a replacement for yeah. one instead of buying the pair. That's good. So currently, you, you get a pair for a hundred bucks. It comes with. Does it come with a sensor? And maybe, yeah, it used to come with a sensor. Um, and so, how much would you pay for a single controller? Uh, Fifty, sixty bucks. I don't know. It is seventy bucks. So oh, I don't know. I don't know if it's worth it. I don't know. But if you break one, which is the use case for this, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, you could get two for ninety nine bucks though, and just put the other one on the shelf until you break that one. <laughs> Fair enough. And then you're good. Get an extra pair. Uh, and I want to uh, put a link to an article in the show notes for people to consider reading. Uh, my friend Rose Evelith, who's a science writer, uh, did a long piece on um, what we understand about empathy and VR according to current research. Yeah. Um, and a lot of her motivation was about how almost every VR talk you attend talks about how there's so much that uh, so much empathic response that happens inside of games. That's our sort of, you know, initial reaction when you're in a lot of these games. Uh, but uh, I think the claims that go beyond what is achieved when you have that kind of empathy mm -hmm. may not may or may not align with current research in terms of what we understand. Some of the research sites, um, Jeremy Bellinson's lab, which we visited down at Stanford, uh, which it, uh, does a lot of work on empathy in VR um, and the pros and cons of it. And it, it tracks back through history of VR because there was research conducted, you know, in the experiments in the, in the 70s and 80s uh, and even 90s. It's a great long read if you're really interested in it. It was really fascinating. I, I enjoyed reading that just because I'm a very, very empathic person when it comes to trying to understand other people's feelings. And I think that helps in a lot of cases, especially with societal factors and working on social networks and stuff and striving to for equality. Uh, and then when, when you consider putting yourself in somebody else's shoes, how uh, this article explains that that's not necessarily what you want to, uh, what you want to have happen uh, whenever you're trying to understand somebody else's uh, point of view. If that's what the goal is. Like, right, I mean, right. there's a lot of games that that's not what their goal is. Yeah. But I think there is the sales point of, of certain, of the power of VR. Yeah. And that might be overstated a mm -hmm. little bit. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like there's there's a harassment conversation to have here too because that is I think augmented in VR it, or it's amplified in VR mm -hmm. as well and this is goes for males and females people just getting in your personal space is something that never happened until VR yeah um, and and I'm continually amazed that people are doing this kind of thing because I do feel like there's an empathy aspect to VR that may, would make you would not want to do that to somebody else it makes it real and why would you 
get in somebody's face like that. And I and I'm looking forward to that problem being solved mm -hmm. in VR space at the low level, you know, at the Oculus and the Vive level, and going all the way up the chain because I, nothing pisses me off more than than people being rude to other people in, in the VR space. All right, uh, do we have a message from Norm? We do. Let me see if he's available for a quick talk. Hey everybody, Norm here, letting you know that this week's episode of This Is Only A Test is brought to you by the podcast, The Art of Charm. The Art of Charm is an iTunes top 50 podcast that's packed with wisdom in the true sense of the word. Uh, from how to become more productive and professional to how to read body language, network and negotiate, it's a show that covers anything to help you become a high performer at home or at work. It brings together interesting people like Neil deGrasse Tyson, Bill Nye and Shaq to discuss things like relationships, life hacking, and success. It's highly addictive and strives to be fun and educational at the same time, so not just stuffy textbook stuff, because personal growth shouldn't be boring all the time. You deserve an extraordinary life, so go to theartofcharm.com slash podcast, or search for The Art of Charm on, po on iTunes, wherever you listen to podcasts, and start taking your life to the next level. We really enjoy this show, and think you will as well, and thank them for sponsoring this week's episode episode and now back to our show we don't have a ton of pop culture news this week a lot of overdue stuff like starting with the fact that black widow is finally getting her own marvel movie yeah about three years too late. Isn't but, that great? But it's awesome. I'm so excited about oh, we're this. We're getting a Black Widow movie, especially because she's a spy, so we'll get another yeah. spy genre movie. Heck yeah. Uh, are you guys excited about this? I am. I'm so excited. I, I really like her character. I, I do too. They've hinted at some weird stuff mm -hmm. back when, you know, I guess she was a dancer. Yeah. Um, and this weird, you know, sounds like a pretty dark history. I'd like to know more. Yeah, I think if... I, do you think it'll be a backstory movie or something future facing? Mm. I think it needs to be a backstory because uh, so far we've had like little inclinations of her her character and we know about her personality, but we don't know like where did she come from. So I think we should get that introduction to her because I think more people would uh, be interested in her as her own character as opposed to just being a part of the uh, what is it the Avengers? Yes, <laughs> fair enough. Will it be Scarlett Johansson if it's a back movie? Yeah, That's I would hope so. Yeah, all right. All right. I think we'll get some Yelena in here. Mm -hmm. That's her spy Ooh. enemy. Um, Guardians 3 has a release date tw in 2020, James Gunn confirmed. Uh, James Gunn is also looking to fund people that will weigh Donald Trump. That's the other thing. That will what? He, <laughs> <laughs> who? James Gunn, the director of Guardians, also put out on Twitter right after this that he wants somebody to ac accurately weigh Donald Trump. It was real oh, weird. To weigh him? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> real weird. Real oh, weird. That's funny. Um so, uh, what you put a link to a trailer that I missed. I did. Uh, yeah, what? a new Netflix show called Altered Carbon, which looks unreal. Uh, I was really thrilled when you put this on there. This is a sci-fi futuristic take. Basically, the premise is that uh, we have the ability to humans in the future have the ability to sort of store people and bring them back to life, and they bring back this investigator type. Um, very Blade Runner esque type Deckard character hmm. to investigate an, inve uh, an attempted murder. It looks like what if we got Blade Runner the series? Um, if that's what the landscape looks like, and it's a Netflix original, and it comes out I think in a couple months. The effects look great. Yeah, everything looks pretty amazing in this, and that and I was pretty sold on the on the the sci-fi story idea yeah. of we can bring people back, we put them in storage, it's sort of Matrix-esque. Yeah. Um, and we get that sort of futuristic landscape. It yeah. does have a Philip K. Dick mm -hmm. kind of feel to it, yeah. which is funny because we're getting, uh, what is it, Electric Dreams? We right are on too? Amazon, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, I, I Do they have a preview out of that or something? They there might is. Have... Yes, there is a preview. I haven't watched it. Did you watch it? No, I haven't. Well, I've seen the preview and it looks awesome. I haven't watched the actual show yet. I'm I'm a little nervous about it, like, um, just because of how much I love a lot of Philip K. Dick stuff. Same, yeah, same. Uh, so it'll, 
but if they put this kind of budget like mm-hmm. we're seeing with this Netflix show mm-hmm. into shows like that then I'm I'm kind of hopeful because that looks good. Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, from a special effects standpoint it looks really interesting. It's I never watched Babylon Babylon 5, but the effects were interesting at the time because they were cutting edge but not terribly high budget. Does not hold up. And Don't can, go back imagine. and watch <laughs> And but it was only, I think it was probably done on an Amiga. Like it was like the, the special effects were, were wow. what you could do on a budget. And I feel like we're getting to the point where you can do amazing things on a budget. Mm-hmm. And if that if Netflix can now afford a show like this, not that Netflix needs money, but um, I think this is this is great for sci-fi. That's I awesome. think there is news that Adam is rejoicing with. Uh, Studio Ghibli is getting a theme park opening. <gasps> oh look, somebody else on the podcast is pretty excited about this. I'm so excited. Where is this going to happen? Uh, where do you think a Studio Ghibli theme park would open? Uh, Japan. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think 2020 Nippon. is the date. Yep. 2020. What do you want in a Studio Ghibli theme park, Shannon? Oh, man. That's really hard. Wow. I just want experiences. I want it to feel like, you know, when you go to Disneyland and you feel like you're in you're in that that zone. That's what I want the Studio Ghibli park to feel like. I want to be able to go there and feel like I'm a part of the movie. Like, oh. I want to go there and feel like I'm in Princess Mononoke's forest, for so example. So you want the immersive theater more yeah. so than, like, rides I don't, or something? Yeah, I don't want rides. Like, you, uh, another example would be, like, the Harry Potter theme park. You know how you go there and you can interact with different things with an interactive wand? Like, I want to be able to do those kind of things at mm-hmm. a Ghibli park, too. Yeah. Be able to go there and interact with the characters and stuff like that. That's very much the future of theme parks, it seems. Like yeah. Like, the new Star Wars. It's the experience. Disney is supposed to do that. Immersive theaters where where it's all at i hope they bring elements of the museum i haven't been to the museum oh, did the, you go to the museum yes it is so hard to get into btw but it is worth a trip going over there it's just gorgeous and it makes you feel like a kid yeah i hope um i've heard that from a number of people who have gone i hope they bring a little bit of the history and some yeah. of the animation details into the into the park as well totally. is this being funded by disney money or something this park looks mammoth yeah I mean, it looks huge billions and billions of dollars uh, like every, at least in our kids' generation, yeah. Totoro is is owns it right mm-hmm. now. That's where the money's coming from. Is like yeah. every kid is into this right now. No, yeah. not no, your kids. No, uh, they miss no, the Totoro generation. Not, no, we, they've seen many Miyazaki films, but I don't know. I, I'm just surprised that they can afford to make a park like this. This is like Disneyland scale. Uh, I'm I'm not surprised. I mean, T- Totoro is huge. I, they brought the movies back into the theaters for a short time, uh, back in the fall, I believe it was, even in, here in America. And they're also developing new movies. So I'm not surprised at all that they have the funding to be able to do this kind of stuff. All right. Two last stories. Uh, are you guys burger fans? Yeah, why is this Sometimes. a big... I like a good burger. Yeah? But I saw this and I, was, I had never heard of this burger chain. What? I know. I'm not, Shake Shack? So, Shake no, Shack no idea. is no idea. coming to the Bay Area, and that's why this is here. So I have a question for you as burger fans. Yeah. What is your favorite go-to burger from like a chain-esque kind of place? Like not a, oh, I'm, yeah. I go to this one location. I'm a super duper man. Super Duper mm. is excellent. Super Duper is very Shake Shack-esque. It's very juicy, mm-hmm. almost like dripping out of there. Uh, it's really about the burger experience. I love the pickle bar that they have where you yeah. can get, pick up your own pickles. <laughs> Tell me about it. Fries leave a little something to be desired. It's a messy burger. Mm-hmm. I like to get an egg on my burger, which nice. is a little out there, but nice. I, I, enjoy, I enjoy that. Gross. Hey, we all like different things. <laughs> That's true. Um, I'm not that big into burgers myself. I do like like the fancy burgers that you can get sometimes at a sit down restaurant, but or the ones that my husband makes at home. Um, I do like Five Guys though. They mm-hmm. make really good burgers. I will eat that stuff up five, real quick. Five Guys is a, all right. I really don't like the Five Guys fries. What's the one on the East Coast? Well, that was Five, five Guys. Five Guys and Shake Okay, yeah. yeah. I like Five Guys. Five Guys has the peanuts everywhere. You walk in, the peanut shells are all over the floor. What? That's how it is in Virginia. No, that's not how most Five Guys That's are. not how my Five Guys yeah. was. <laughs> yeah, you have, a different, you have a different Five Guys. <laughs> you got some weird Five Guys wherever you live. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I'm really a fan. I, I'm a fan of two that I think have gotten underrated. Habit, which is out here in California. Uh, because they, you can do these awesome peppers on top, Ooh. really give your burger a kick. And I think, I think it's super duper without a little bit of the mess. Mm. 
But I'm a fan of Smash Burger. This is oh, a, a very yeah. controversial because most Smash Burger locations have horrible service. Yeah. So don't like I don't I can't recommend going there. But the idea of making a Smash Burger where you get a, a crispy yeah. burger like a crunch on it. That's it. It's so, good stuff. It. But what's this about? What's the Shake Shack is moving to the Bay Area. Yeah, but we haven't talked about Shake Shack. Sell me on Shake Shack. Uh, but it's not my favorite. So I don't, <laughs> I don't want to. But it's just an opportunity to talk about burgers. Okay. Oh, okay. Shake Shack is opening two locations in the Bay Area. First time they they've moved out here. They're really like known in New York. Mm-hmm. They make good burgers. They have. I think there's one in Vegas too. Okay. Uh, they make good burgers. It's very super duper esque. All right. Is what to think about it. Um, last thing. Our Jeremy Williams mm. fell victim to Gunther's oh. field of influence. They don't care And about got this. him interested in cryptocurrency. No, how we, are you doing? We don't oh. have to make this a personal story. No, just, just, just report. no, no. I just want to know how you're doing because it's been a, it's been a rough couple of days in cryptocurrency. All land. my money is gone. All <laughs> my money. I was, <laughs> uh, Bitcoin sank 20% by the time I posted this. Ooh. It sank another 20% last night. Ouch. It is, it's down to half of its all-time high. Uh, it's under $10,000 right now. It peaked around almost 20000 mm-hmm. mid- mid-December. And um, we, have, we have famously a producer here on, on, on our staff who is very excited about Bitcoin. And we will have him on the show to analyze the Bitcoin markets for us at some point in the future. And it's fascinating telling you to hear this guy talk about Bitcoin. Especially when you go into the other markets, like the Ethereum, the- Yeah, all the, the altcoins. What was the what was the one where the guy, uh, Laps, or what was it called? Laps? The, not Laps. Um, the one where the guy became richer than Zuckerberg for like a day. <laughs> Ripple. Ripple. Yeah. Ripple. <laughs> Yeah, for a day. For yeah, a no, day. that that was over three dollars. It's now down under a dollar. Wow. Um, yeah, the the all of the cryptocurrency markets are kind of tanking right now, mm-hmm. following Bitcoin's lead. But if you look at the, it's fine. Everything's fine. Yeah. We're, we're, it it's just, volatile. Exactly. It's volatile as hell. And we just we needed this correction. Give it a couple of days. Give it maybe a couple of weeks. Be back to back to normal. Okay. Well, just follow Jeremy's like basic facial demeanor <laughs> over the next couple of weeks and we'll see Everything's if we can fine. predict uh, how the how the market is going. Yeah. All right. You want to do some science? Yeah, let's do the science. All righty. And why does my thing keep muting? Now it's time for a moment of science. Three stories this week. First, let's go to Australia. You've been to Australia recently. Yeah. Last year. Once. <laughs> Once. It was awesome. Norm, Joey, and Adam. Well, Adam's about to go on tour in Australia, so uh, he's hopping across from New Zealand. I, I don't know if Norm and Joey are actually going to make it over this time. But uh, Wait, and- can you fly direct from San Francisco to New Zealand? Yeah. Oh, Air New Zealand. How about that? Oh. Uh, a story came out um, recently in Current Biology uh, about rookeries for sea turtles along the Australian shore near the Great Barrier Reef. Mm-hmm. And they were looking at how this population is doing because the population has actually exploded over the past couple of years. So they're examining what's the health of this colony. And uh, I didn't know this about sea turtles, but sea turtles' uh, gender is determined. Actually, I'm sorry, sea turtles' sex is determined when they lay eggs. Yeah, don't apply any judgment. Yeah, them. no judgment. Um, and what the temperature of the sand and the conditions of the water actually tend to determine the sex of of the of the hatchling and so when the waters have warmed and the sand is warm due to climate change we've seen an explosion in the female population whoa how explosive uh they outnumber the males in this one rookery 116 to one now whoa (laughs) So good wow. times for that one wow. male, I guess. Well, you, um, you but say that. You say that but I don't no. think that's how it actually feels. So they're worried about what the future of this rookie will be if the yeah. population will just crash because now they've lost a great deal of potential genetic diversity um, with the limited number of males. Is this going to lead to an overall decline in the population pretty quickly? Um, there is language that scientists use that usually stick out to me. Um, and one of the scientists said this is one of the most extreme of extreme conditions. That's not scientist language to talk in that way. Yeah. Um, so this is definitely sounding uh, alarm bells. I'll put a link to the National Geographic story 
and the link to the to the paper in current biology uh, that goes into a lot more detail. But this is so fascinating that I, when we think about climate change and ocean acidification, all of that stuff that comes along with it, we're obviously we tend to think about like sea level rise mm -hmm. and how that's going to affect coastal communities. Uh, we don't think about like things in this way where it's going to affect like the reproduction of a species or its ability to you know just create offspring or, or just you know move and migrate. Right. Yeah. And that's just one step away. It's the whole butterfly effect going on. There's on down the chain. Yeah. Um, so sorry, that was a downer a little bit. <laughs> I can do I can do better though. Okay. Let's give us hope for a total recall planet because there is new analysis that came out on Mars uh, this past week where they had uh, satellites in the atmosphere, especially the high rise, uh, looking down at Martian ice to understand the water we've mm -hmm. known water is in the in these different polar caps and, mm -hmm. and stuff on Mars for a while now uh, and what they're doing is they're analyzing the reflectivity the albedo of that ice the reflectivity of the light off it to understand how pure the ice is and potentially how at what depths it goes at oh. and they did an analysis that shows that there is um, ice it is actually mostly water. It's not like soil jammed up in the ice in these polar ice caps that go from about one meter to about 100 meters in depth, which is actually wow. a reasonable depth to actually mine the ice. And because it's not so clouded with crap like with other soil, it actually shows some potential for harvesting that ice and turning into water. Whoa. There's problems, though. Oh. Um, so all of these regions that they analyze so far are above the 30th uh, the 30th or 33rd latitude on that planet where it gets extremely cold. Um, and so all of the plots where we're talking about landing is really around like the 60th latitude on Mars. So this is not in an area that humans would go mm -hmm. potentially. So that's a, a problem. The other thing is um, Mars doesn't have a very um, big atmosphere. So a lot of times the ice, as it becomes exposed, gets lost to space. It sublimates. It goes directly from ice to, to vapor and goes off to space. So this has to be in these really specific spots where basically like almost like rubble is covering the ice and mm -hmm. protecting it from, from that happening. So it's sort of a, uh, we don't know how common this is, but this is a great analysis. Think about that. They just put a satellite over this area and just shown a light on it saw it reflected and were able to gather this kind of level of information. Yeah. Wow. How come we didn't do this before? Yeah. Well, we need a certain type of optical satellite that was able to gather this. We didn't data. just deploy a new satellite, did we? High rise is relatively recent. I don't think it's been there for a long time. Huh. Like post rovers? Um, post one of the rovers, yeah. Well, I have to look up when high right. rise got there. When I saw this headline, I just assumed that a rover did some drilling. No, no, no. This was done from, from yeah, space. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um... All right, anyway, I'll look up when, when High Rise launched. And just for the record, just how cold is it there? Do you know? On that, uh -huh. on that, oh, I did know. Cold? I don't remember. How cold is it? I mean, so you said <laughs> extremely cold, and it's all relative. Um, No, I don't know. But you, I'll look it up. You wouldn't want to visit. I'll look it up and dub it in. Okay. It is <laughs> cold. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And one of the news, um, Neil Tyson announced that Cosmos is returning for season two dun, in dun, spring dun. of 2019. Yay! Yeah, my family did watched. Uh, we made cookies and Cosmos our Sunday. Oh, our that's Sunday night. so cute! Yeah, we'd bake a different kind of cookie and watch Cosmos. Oh my god! I had a adorable. watching party every week as well. Um, I I didn't love it as much as the Carl Sagan initial series. It's hard yeah. to love something that much. Yeah. Um, but uh, I thought it was a worthy successor. Um, and a, a note, uh, we were, I was filming for a, a Star Wars thing down at JPL last year, and this was, I don't know, like six months ago, and there was a Cosmos crew down there. Oh, uh, cool. And so there, I was like, uh, we ran into another crew. I'm like, mm. oh, who are you with? And they're like, Cosmos, shh. Oh, <laughs> nice. Uh, and they were just doing some scouting. So this series is going to look towards the future. It's called, I think it's subtitled Other Planets. And Andrinian, who is uh, Carl Sagan's widow, mm -hmm. has indicated she wants this series to look much more far future than the initial season, which was really like a revisitation yeah. of what the initial cosmos was. Right, right. Um, so this is, I think, going to have much more of like, could we go to another planet? What do other planets look like? Um, I like that new take on things. It, it's exciting. That's awesome. The and more Neil deGrasse Tyson can address the public, the better. Mm 
I agree. He has a really good way of explaining things that anybody can understand, even if you don't have a scientific mind, yeah. which a lot of times, uh, a lot of the scientific universe, I don't understand since that wasn't my profession. Mm-hmm. I'm more technical. <laughs> I'm, I'm a computer person. I'm a hacker. I'm not big on scientific stuff. But he does a great job of explaining things that make me excited to share the information that he shared with me. So I love that I'm able to sponge up all this knowledge that I might not be able to use in my profession, but it makes me excited to see where humanity is going to go in the future. Yeah. Sign of a good teacher. Yeah, exactly. Negative 150 Celsius. Oh, wow. At, at the polar ice caps. Wow. So a little cold. A <laughs> little chilly. Yeah. A yeah. little oh, chilly. Oh. So it's like just a touch warmer than how it was during the bomb cyclone. Norm's, Norm's, the Norm's wow. new Han, Han Parka ain't going to cut it. No, <laughs> I don't think so. So that's it. Uh, let's go to our last segment. Testing this week. Hey, what have you guys been testing? High Rise was launched in 2005. Mm. Okay. To Mars. Anything you guys have been testing? Mm. I think Shannon's job is Hi. testing products, so I imagine <laughs> she has a few things. Anything coming up on Tech Thing that you're you're testing right now? Let's see. Um, yes, I got a Dell Visor in. It's their virtual reality visor, so I'm going to be messing around with that. I have not played with it very much yet, so I can't say whether or not it is good. That's the Windows Mixed Reality? Yes, yeah. exactly. And I'm really excited to see how it does as far as um, you know being able to do tasks with it, not necessarily just gaming, which is what I've been doing with virtual reality. Um, I've also gotten a LawsBot TAS6 that I built on Hack 5 uh, in December. So I'm going to start doing some 3D prints with that. And That's a I'm, fast printer. I like that printer. It's a very fast printer. It's really good. It's a big printer. It's a big printer, which I like, though, because it'll give me a chance to do much bigger prints. That um, I, I had built a 3D printer like five years ago, and it was horrible. Like The temperature was never right. The extruder always jammed. So I learned about all the different parts of 3D printing, but it was such a terrible experience for me. I never got back into 3D printers until now Hmm. and I'm kind of glad I waited five years because now you can just like pull them out of the box and they're ready to go (laughs) which is awesome but uh, I'm hoping that I can learn more about doing my own like CAD designs and stuff that I can 3D print myself as opposed to just going to like Thingiverse and printing things yeah super cool yeah what about you Kishore nothing really much I'm still continuing on my Infinity Gauntlet build which is kind of stuck right now I'm a little (laughs) I'm a little stuck on on this like piece for a thumb. I'm working on a project uh, for a for a client, and I had to do welding for the first time. Oh wow! So that was exciting. Cool. I didn't I didn't know anything about welding. Well, Adam welds. That's, yeah, you know something, not a big deal around here, I suppose, for some. But for me, it was a new thing. He admits that he's not like the greatest welder in the world or anything. He's relatively new to that whole area too. So I have a friend, a friend of the show, Zach Radding, who who is also a welder, and, and he helped me uh, weld steel together. And apparently the, the bond is, is pretty darn good when it comes to welding. Cool. Um, it's pre- basically like, why is that happening? It, it just <laughs> creates one big piece of steel. And it was fun. Like, apparently, like, this, what happens is you, you have the gun, and out of the gun comes this little tiny uh, tube of steel. Okay. And then the, it conducts electricity with what you're welding it to, a lot of it. And then it just it creates this uh, basically hot glue out of steel, and it zzz. we call it a plasma, but okay. Yeah, there you go. That and sounds there's, awesome. There's argon involved. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. Argon insulates the from the uh, outside oxygen and stuff, so you can create because there's a jet of yeah. of gas that comes. I'm so down glad the, you're here to explain these magic. I've things never welded to in us. my life, but <laughs> <laughs> it's super cool because you got to wear the the visor and you, yeah. but you can't see to the real world when it's actually welding. But <laughs> you, there's it's the kind of thing I would like to get good at. It's pretty cool. It's like it's soldering, but it's crazy. Like you can get mm-hmm. sunburned. It'll be really know. useful for the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> I suppose it would. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Making my tank. Mm-hmm. You making like a steel based game frame? No. I'm like, I'm going to have to guess for a while what you're yeah. doing. Uh, I have a, 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 on Monday, I'm doing my second episode of Science versus Cinema at the mm-hmm. Alamo Draft House. We're watching Galaxy Quest. 
Yeah. So me and my astronomer friend Jeff Silverman will be up there. So if anyone's in San Francisco, come out. But also, we have a premium um, unauthorized commentary where I sat down with Adam and Norm and we watched Galaxy Quest. And Adam actually worked on a couple of effects in the film. So we got to talk about that. That'll be coming up soon. Shannon, what's coming up um, uh, for you on Tech Thing or, or ThreatWire or anything else? Oh, man, so much. Uh, well, uh, I have a personal channel. It's called Snubs Report. It's YouTube.com slash Shannon Morse. And I've been posting a whole bunch of Japan vlogs there from my last trip to Japan. So check those out if you're interested in Japanese culture from a tourist's perspective, I guess you would say. Uh, although I do know some of the language, so I didn't just go to like touristy sites. Keep that in mind. Um, on Threatwire, I just talked about Spectre and Meltdown, which affected CPUs. We were so- accused last week of, of not being taken that seriously enough. A lot of people, we, we covered them. And uh, we said well, you know, to be honest, a lot of information security prof- professionals are saying, don't panic. So I think it's fine if you, if, you know, you sit down and say, don't panic, because it's, it's not something that we should panic about because it will be fixed. So it's okay. I, I disagree <laughs> with their assessment. I yeah. think we were just sort of shocked at how big of a, a vulnerability and how mm-hmm. it was new. It was a new yeah. kind of vulnerability. It's a zero day. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, I did a huge explanation on ThreatWire. That's going to be up later today as of the recording date that we're doing right now. Tech thing, we have a bunch of reviews coming in from CES. So a bunch of companies have opted to send us products. So we'll be reviewing a bunch of new things there. And then on Hack 5, my co-host Darren Kitchen has been hosting a payload series. So if you're interested in doing like hacker type uh, uh, stuff, like with the USB rubber ducky and the Wi-Fi pineapple, which are both of our products, uh, definitely check out that series that Darren's doing on our channel. So I'm sure you'll put the links in the show notes for those. Obviously. And where can people find you? Uh, so I'm on Twitter. That's the easiest place to find me. Disclaimer, I do a lot about uh, women's equality and a lot about hacking tweets there. So I'm at snubs, S-N-U-B-S. Or you can find me on, I would just say youtube.com slash hack5 is the main place where I do all my shows. Awesome. Anything coming up with you, Jeremy? No. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. Nothing at all. <laughs> Nothing. All right. You heard it here first, audience. Help Jeremy find something to do. <laughs> no, 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 I'll give you something <laughs> to do. No, I don't need that. I don't need that. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us this week. I think Norm is na- back next week and will regale us with stories of New Zealand. Um, but that's it for this week. Thanks for joining us. We have an outro? We do from Justin, a.k.a. Speed. Hi there. I didn't see you. That's it. Discover theme is also growing on me. The, the opening theme. I wish I would. No, no, no. That's Jurassic no, Park. No, 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 no. Do, 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 do. No, no, no. That's it. I forgot to give a shout out to Ryan and Gunther, who actually did a lot of work in here with Danica to make this room look so good. They don't ask for anything. No, That's but I mean, it. they deserve something. That's I am, I'm going to miss not being you know, like bumping into that and knocking down the ZF1. Oh, yeah. Don't back bump there. into that when you back up. Nothing's, really? Nothing's glued down. Nothing's glued down? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I knocked that gun down Good like to know. three or four times. It was pretty amazing. I'm going to miss those days. All right. Bye. See ya.